Hello, everyone. Welcome back. It's kind of hard to believe, but we're wrapping up module number three and the final artifacts of this module, which will all deal with the art and architecture to some extent of the Baroque world. And to frame this chronologically, we can think of the Baroque as being a period from around 1600 until around 1680. And there are a couple of things that are framing this time frame in Europe very broadly. And one of the things we haven't even talked about yet, and so now is a good time to do so. The first of them is a colossal happening in 1517 that very much shakes the religious and social core of Europe, and that is the Council, or pardon me, the Protestant Reformation. In 1517, a Catholic priest by the name of Martin Luther uh, nails to the, the doors of the cathedral in Wittenberg the 95 theses. And these were 95 complaints that Luther had with the Holy Mother Church in Rome. This uh, did not go well for Luther in some ways because eventually he was excommunicated from the church and eventually uh, uh, marked as a heretic. It worked out really well for Martin Luther in some other ways for he founded or was the beginning of what historians now call the Protestant Reformation. And the Protestant Reformation takes place in a number of parts of Europe at the same time with slightly different but the same overall goal. So different results in the same goal. The first one of those goals was the break and change of the Catholic Church. And so Martin Luther breaks with the Catholic Church and begins his own. It's the Protestant Reformed Church. And that same change happens not only in Germany, but in other places like in Switzerland and importantly in England as well. And so the Protestant Reformation um, is the beginning of the break, the splintering of the Catholic Church. And I mentioned to you long ago, you know, prior to this, there's an Eastern Church and a Western Church, and the Western Church is the Catholic Church, and it's just called the Church. There's no other churches. Um, the Protestant Reformation changes that. It begins in 1517. Now, the changes happen in different places for different reasons. German or in Germany, Luther was after theological changes. In England, it was more of a political change. Henry VIII was married to someone he didn't want to be married to. The Pope wouldn't let him get divorced. And so, I mean, this is simplifying things greatly, but eventually Henry VIII says, okay, fine, I'll make a new church and I'll be the head of the Church of England. And so, so when you go to England, there are Catholic churches, of course, but it's the Anglican Church in in the United States, it's called the Episcopalian Church, um, but it's the Anglican Church. The center is in Canterbury, which is sort of over here. Um, and technically speaking, the head of the the the, uh, the English Church is the Archbishop of Canterbury. So, so step number one, they want to break with the Catholic Church. This happens in Germany, in England, in Switzerland, and even parts of France as well. Well, this has some problems for the Catholic Church, and and the the snarky historian will will give you the first reason. To begin with, when you go to a church um, and you go to mass, there's a couple of things that happen. Right, you sit, stand, kneel. You sit, stand, kneel. You walk, you eat some bread, um, but you also throw money in the collection plate. And so, over the course of decades of people fleeing the Catholic Church, the finances of the of the Catholic Church began to st strain. And this happens for a couple of reasons. One, the wars of the Papal States, because the Papal States seemingly were at war with anyone. Um, and then secondly, the large-scale building programs that are happening all throughout Rome and other parts of Italy, Italy as well. So beginning in the 1550s, continuing through the 1560s, the Council, can, the, the Catholic Church convenes what's called the Council of Trent. And this is such an important three words that I'm going to say it again in the hopes that you write it down if you didn't the first time. The Council of Trent. The Council of Trent was the meeting of the leadership of the Roman Church in Trento, which is in northern Italy, as a way of bringing the faithful back to the Catholic faith. And they did so. And one of the reasons, one of the ways they wanted to do so was through the use of art. You could frame it a different way and say propaganda, but let's just say art. Because they believed that art 
could do three things. It could move, it could delight, and it could educate. And those are the three verbs that the, the church used when describing art. It could move, it could educate, and it can delight. And if you think about this, it's true, right? Beautiful art can move you, like spiritually. I'll show you what I think are some good examples. Um, it can educate you. I must say, as a Catholic, I probably learned more about the scripture by being an art history student than I ever did by going to Mass. Because I'm Catholic, we don't really read the Bible in some ways. And then finally, um, it can delight, right? The reason why people go to museums now is because it's fun, right? It's, it's, it's an enjoyable experience. And so the Catholic Church begins to use art as a way of bringing people back into the fold of the Catholic Church. And so our next three artifacts are primarily going to deal with architecture, painting, and sculpture in Catholic places, places like Italy and Spain and parts of France and, uh, and Flanders. And then secondly, the Protestant world, places like the Netherlands and to a lesser extent, Germany. So we're going to break it up into Catholic and non-Catholic places. And surpri not surprisingly, we begin to see different kinds of art in different parts of the world on the basis only of religion. So let's talk about those things. In the north, places like Germany and Holland, although we'll spend most of our time in Holland because Holland is two things, really wealthy, exceedingly wealthy, and secondly, um, open to artistic expression in a way in which Germany somewhat wasn't. In in, in the Baroque North, we have five kinds of art that are relatively new and come back again and again throughout the 17th century. We begin to see group portraiture, which allows people to all put in a little bit for a big work of art. Etchings and engravings, which allows the middle class to buy works of art that are inexpensive. Still life compositions, they're small uh, depictions of uh, things like a basket of fruit on a tabletop, landscapes, and then genre paintings. A genre painting is, a, is generally a quiet picture of everyday life. These are the kinds of things that we see in the North and they are generally accessible to an affluent and rising middle class. In Italy, however, and, and one can maybe even broaden this out a little bit and say Italy or Catholic Baroque, we see large state-sponsored commissioned commissions that were created to further the religious and political ideology of the Council of Trent. So we have the church commissioning, big stuff. And secondly, we have smaller stuff that's also generally religious in nature that was meant to further the ideology of the Council of Trent. The key point here is particularly in Italy, what we're gonna be looking at is a lot of religious art. There'll be some classical-y things as well, but we're gonna look at a lot of classical art. Now, when we think about the Catholic Baroque more broadly, there are some characteristics that we'll see quite consistently. And once you begin to recognize this, you will be able to, I think, designate a work as being Baroque from two museum rules, rooms away. The first of these is a deliberate attempt, both in painting and in sculpture, at theatricality. If the Renaissance time period was one of balance and stability and symmetry, this is gonna be quite a bit different. Renaissance statues seemed still, didn't they? Like we looked at Michelangelo or Donatello's David, they seem to be static, not dynamic. And in the Renaissance time frame, we will have motion that is implied within sculptures. And what this will uh, suggest to us also is a passage of time. When it comes to painting, and to some extent, sculpture as well, in a really, really cool way, but, for, but painting in particular, will have this interest in what's called chiaroscuro which is a spotlight effect created by dramatic uses of light 
and dark. It will be as if Jesus is in a dark room with a spotlight shining upon him. And this will be very, very dramatic. In both Italian painting, but actually as importantly in Flemish painting, we will have these strong diagonal lines that are, will take our eyes hither or thither. I mean, again, art makers are manipulators. They are able to lead our eye places by, on the basis of line. And so we will see Flemish and Italian artists doing this. If Renaissance works were balanced and stable, Baroque paintings are going to be decidedly not so. And then finally, when it comes to sculpture, there's not going to be an ideal viewing angle. And what I mean to suggest by this is that when you go look at a, a Renaissance statue, everyone pretty much stands in front of it. And when you go look at, look at a Bernini statue, everyone's going to walk around it. So to begin with, my friends, we're going to look at a really important building. And then we're going to look at some paintings. And in the next artifact, we'll look at another building and some sculpture. So let us get our roll on. When you go to Italy, and you should, um, one of the cool buildings you can go visit is a church that, that in English we call Il Gesù. Um, but if you go to, to Rome, you can, it's just called the Jesu, the Jesu. And Jesu is kind of a, an Italian word, more or less for Christ, but the Jesu means this church here. It was constructed in 1568, immediately following the conclusion of the Council of Trent. Trent and the, arch, the architect is Giacomo della Porta. And this is the first Jesuit church. The Jesuit order is perhaps the most important order um, that, that's been founded in the last 500 years. And there are many orders of Catholic priests, right? There's Dominicans and Franciscans, um, Benedictines. I mean, there are many of them. But the Jesuits were founded during the Council of Trent as a way of becoming the roving theological and educational army of the Pope. It was founded by St. Ignatius of Loyola, a Spanish nobleman, and the Jesuit mission is theology, conversion, and education. And so much so that, that the, the overwhelming majority of Catholic universities in the United States are Jesuit in order. So, for example, in, in New Orleans, there's a Loyola. It's named after St. Ignatius of Loyola. It is a Jesuit school. And you can rattle off Catholic schools in the United States, and the overwhelming majority of them are Jesuit. Notre, Notre Dame in Indiana, Jesuit. Boston College, Jesuit. Gonzaga, Jesuit. Georgetown, Jesuit. Um, the Jesuits' mission was education and conversion. And so immediately after the foundation of the Jesuit order, they began with five priests. They immediately scattered to the wind as a way of converting people who didn't look or think like them. Um, right after I finished my PhD, I read a book. It's got to be behind me here on the shelf uh, by a, an, a scholar. by the, I believe his name was O'Malley. Um, and the book was called The First Jesuits. Uh, and it was a history of the first five Jesuit church, uh, priests where they went and what they did. And so one of those guys, I always remember it because I'm a Green Bay Packer fan, sorry. Um, and his last name was Favre, um, pronounced differently, but spelled the same way. And so so one of, so he was one of the first Jesuits. St. Ignatius of Loyola, of course, was another one of them. Um, and then Fran St. Francis Xavier was another one. And there's a church outside Tucson um, named after him because he came through the American Southwest. They ended up in Southeast Asia all over the world. The Jesuits are a really, really fascinating group. And I went to a Jesuit high school. Um, Jesuit priests have essentially two PhDs, one in an academic discipline that involves what they teach. Um, and the other is systematic theology. <laughs> So I pretty feel pretty proud of myself. You know, I have a PhD and I have less education than most of my high school teachers. So my my chemistry teacher, Father Bob, um, 
had a PhD in systematic theology from the American, American Pontifical University in Rome, and then a PhD in chemistry, um, I think from Gonzaga. So all of this is to say they're really, really smart, and this is their first church. And then we look at the exterior of the church and even the plan of the church. There are some things that echo for us that are similar to what we've seen, but also remarkably different. It is, all things considered, a axial aligned Latin cross plan with a large central nave and smaller side aisles. Beyond that, there's a big central dome that is hidden here behind this facade. And there's some things present in this facade that honestly, we've never really seen before outside of a little whisper in Florence. And that is, it is horizontal on the base here, slightly vertical at top. And rather than circles and squares, which seem to be so prevalent um, within the realm of Renaissance architecture, during the Baroque time frame, things like ovals and convex and concave lines are going to be embraced. And we'll look a little bit more at this next time when we look at St. Peter's and Borromini San Carlo alla Quattro Fontane. But for the time being, please know that the, 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 the curving lines of this is very different than the kinds of things we saw within Renaissance architecture. On the inside of the church, however, is where the really fascinating stuff happens. And I'll say a little bit about this church. So in, in 19, when I took um, students here, our first walk, you know, our first uh, uh, first day in Rome, we started at the Pantheon. We walked past this. I said, hey, say hello to the Jesu. We'll come back later. Uh, we walked past this along this street here, off to the Column of Trajan and over to the Colosseum. And we came back later on in the week. And, and in the summertime in Rome, it's very hot. Um, and and there are dress codes to get in churches, right? It's a place of worship. The, the, the churches, generally speaking, want you to be modestly dressed. But we didn't have any problems in any church. So if the women walked in with bare shoulders or shorts on, this was generally okay in most churches. Um, my wife went in here with us um, when we visited, and she had on shorts and like a t-shirt and she had a shawl for her shoulders in case in case people thought she wasn't covered enough and they would not let her into this church because she had on shorts so the jesuits honestly do not mess around what i call your attention to here is the ceiling vault of il jesu and it was done by an italian painter at the end of the 17th century 17th century his name was giovanni battista gauli and this painting is called Triumph in the Name of Jesus. And he has painted this ceiling vault. All of this that you're looking at, all of it, every single bit is painted. That's not decoration on the ceiling vault. It's painted. These aren't statues. They are painted. And he has painted this ceiling vault as if the top of the church has exploded and Ignatius of Loyola is rising up to heaven to be meet, met by Jesus. This thing is, oh my goodness, ha! Ah, fantastic. It is a riot. You, you can't not look at it. And again, it moves, it educates, and it delights. When you go see it in person, and again, all of this is painted, like the statues have shadows painted on all of this to further and create the illusionistic feel. All statues. There's clouds floating with shadows from, from the clouds. And when you go visit it, your neck gets so tired <laughs> that what they've done is put a large scale mirror so you can stand in front of the mirror and look at the reflection of the ceiling and it's actually not a bad way to look at it. I mean, here you can see the, this bolting, this lightning strike almost with the abbreviation of the Jesuit or IHS. 
It literally uh, translates as the Society of Jesus. That's the formal name for the Jesuit order. And there's the IHS here. So all of this is to say that the Jesuit order has a remarkably important impact uh, on the Baroque world as it exists in um, Italy and beyond during the 17th century. And so, so we're going to come back to some architecture for our next artifact, but this is such a nice segue into another art maker that we're going to spend our time talking about today. So, so if we play our cards correctly, what we'll do for the rest of today is look at the art of an Italian artist named Caravaggio, and then we might shift gears a little bit and go to Spain and look at the work of an artist by the name of Velazquez and hopefully made maybe a Flemish artist by the name of Peter Paul Rubens as well. In order to begin, I want to show you some early Caravaggios. Caravaggio um, is from the northern part uh, of Italy, from a small town of Caravaggio. His, his given name is Michelangelo de Merisi, but there was already a Michelangelo who was an art maker, and so art historians have simply called him by the town in which he was from. Caravaggio. This is not all that uncommon. Leonardo da Vinci. Leonardo was from the town of Vinci. So it's not his last name. It's just where he's from. And so when we, when art historians refer to this art maker, we call him either Leonardo or Leonardo da Vinci, but we never refer to him as da Vinci because da Vinci is just a town. Da Vinci means from Vinci. Caravaggio is is one of the art makers that we actually refer to him by his by his place of origin. So I want to show you a couple of early Caravaggios because it will show you where he goes. He does these when he's still uh, in the north. These are depictions of of common everyday people and actually some poor people as well. The fortune teller on the left and the card sharks on the right. We'll see this head come back to us in some ways. I don't want to go into these too much, but how about this? This shows both of them, this guy and that guy, a well-to-do young lad being taken advantage of people who are a little more base. This is a fortune teller, and you can't see it in this image, but she's sliding the ring off his finger. And this guy here, and this is our wealthy guy, I beg your pardon, this guy here is a wealthy dude. I mean, look at his hat, look at his velvet cloak. And he's playing cards with this guy here who is decidedly of a lower class, right? His, his sleeve has been torn. He's wearing more, more everyday clothing. And this guy is looking over his shoulder at his cards, gesturing to this guy who's pulling a card out of his, out of his, uh, out of his waistcoat. And so early on, Caravaggio is interested in Depictions of the upper class getting taken advantage of the lower class. As time goes on, however, Caravaggio moves, he goes to Rome, and he begins to paint religious works. And so we'll look at a couple of those. One is from 1601, and the other was painted a couple of years later, but as part of a series, um, and done at about the same time. So what you're looking at here is a painting called The Conversion of St. Paul. It's in a church called Santa Maria de Popolo, which is one of the northernmost churches um, in the city proper of Rome. It's in one of the side chapels. And I gotta tell you, in 2019, I went to this church like seven different times to try to look at this painting again. And the church was either closed or mass was going on and they couldn't get back there to it. And so, golly, I wanted to go look at this again and I couldn't, So, but you're, but I still got pictures, so it's all good. This shows a story from the life of St. Paul. St. Paul was an early convert to Christianity who, when on the road to Damascus, he falls from his horse and he has a kind of religious conversion. <clears throat> At this point, Paul or Saul, which was his Jewish name, stops being Saul and he takes on a different name, Paul. And then he becomes, you know, the great disciple of Christ in the early period. I mean, and Paul, Paul has a Euro rape rail pass and Paul goes everywhere. And so this is a, is a picture from that conversion. And so I call your attention to eye level. All paintings 
have an eye level, right? All paintings, once a perspective begins to be utilized, has a has a place where your eye naturally should be placed in order for the space to be comprehensible. And so, for example, if you were above the horse, you'd see the top of the horse. If you were below the horse, you would see its belly. So where is our eye level? And once you look at it and think about it for just a second, you'll come to the conclusion that our eye level is somewhere about here. And when you see paintings, eye level, the wherever eye level is in the composition is about where eye level should be where it's hung. And you'll see this true in some Caravaggio paintings in a second. And so this is about eye level, which means if we were standing, eye level would be here. But because our eye level is around here, it means that we too are not standing. We too have been knocked to the ground. We too are going through a religious kind of conversion, the same kind of religious conversion that Paul is going through. This is a great example of that chiaroscuro, that dramatic use of light and dark. It's as if we are in a nighttime scene. Think about this dark shadow behind the horse, the dark shadow behind his attendant's head. And because of the shadows here, I mean, think about the shadow from the flank of the horse here. We know that our light source is coming this way, right? This part of his arm is illuminated. This arm is in shadow. So all of this speaks to the dramatic use of light and dark, that chiaroscuro that Caravaggio becomes so well known for. Now, when, we, when I show you pictures like this, it's often a picture from a textbook, and those have been shot with spotlights on them in order to illuminate them. But when you see these things in real light, they often look a little bit darker, and it changes the way they feel. I mean, this again, look at that bright shadow. Wow. This is how you view that painting in real life. I mean, the horse seems wider, the darker seems darker. Like, I mean, think about the ways in which you can see this hind leg here. It's hardly visible here. This dramatic use of light and dark is a really, really important idea with Caravaggio's painting. And we'll certainly see it with a work here. The, this picture dates from, I think, 2000. 2015 when I was here and in 2019 they're still working on the outside of the church. What you're looking at here is the front of Santa Luigi de Francesi and I'll translate the French into English for you. St. Louis of the French. There is a French church in Rome where mass is done in French. There's an American church in Rome for that matter as well. It's Santa Susana, another great example of Baroque architecture. This isn't really a Baroque church, but there are some Baroque, um, Baroque paintings inside of it. And this is one of them. This is Caravaggio's the calling of St. Matthew. And it was begun in 1597. It was part of an entire series of paintings um, called the Matthew Cycle. They're all in a small little chapel here um, in, in the church. So you walk in the front of the church, go off to the left, and walk to the front of the church, and these three paintings are there. It's a really important painting and a lovely painting um, and, and such a fantastic work that when we began our walking tour in 2019 and the tour guy said, he asked me like, had you, have you been to Rome before? And I said, yeah, this is my ninth trip. He's like, oh, so you know Rome. I'm like, yeah, bucko, I know Rome. He said, where do you want to go? I was like, you know what? I'm just an art history professor. You're a Rome tour guide. How about this? Um, we were sort of not far from the Pantheon. I was like, why don't you take us to Piazza Navona? Um, let's hit the Pantheon. And if we could hit the Caravaggio paintings in Santa Luigi da Francesi, I'd be a happy guy. So the first day in Rome, I took students here. We went back a couple more times. Um, but it's a really, really fabulous work. And let's begin by talking what we see. On the right-hand side of the painting, we have two figures, one facing us, one with his back to us. The man with his back to us is St. Peter. He's wearing his orange and blue uniform as he always does. And the man facing us 
of course, is Jesus. He's got one of the great halos in the history of all time great halos. And he has gestured off with his right hand, pointing more or less to the group on the left. This beautiful shadow falling just above his head, bisecting his halo, and his hand illuminated, set off across that dark background like so. This is just fabulous. If we follow that line here to there, it gets us right to here, right to the face of St. Matthew. Matthew looks up wearing his fancy tam o' shanter. It's a kind of like a Baroque hat that Matthew never would have wear, worn if he was alive around the year zero. And Matthew looks up with a kind of surprised look on his face. And he points to himself points to himself. Here's Jesus with that halo. Wow. I mean, think about how far we've come as it pertains to halos. I mean, I told you way back when you could write a cool dissertation about halos because here's where we started. And then we eventually get to Caravaggio where we have these beautiful, wispy, three-dimensional halos um, that seem to magically float above the head of our saint or Christ. Like, there it is. Now, the scripture tells us a couple of things. One, St. Matthew was a tax collector. And so what he's shown doing here is counting money. You can see there's an ink pot next to him, a quill, and there are other people, presumably those who work with him, who are counting money. The scripture also tells us something interesting, and in that when Christ called Matthew, he did so with two words, follow me, follow me. And when we think about that, Matthew looks up, uh, looks over at Christ and points to himself as if to, to, as if to respond, me? Do you want me? And and there's probably no film nerds in the room right now, but I, I am a film nerd. And as a matter of fact, a little while ago when talking about the Jesuits, I was thinking about a Martin Scorsese film, which is based on a Japanese novel called Silence. Um, the movie has Liam Nielsen and Andrew Garfield and Adam Driver, and it's absolutely fabulous. But I also, in turn, thought about, um, when I think about this, I think about Scorsese, one of Scorsese's really early great films called Taxi Driver with a really young Robert De Niro. And even if you don't know the movie, you might know the scene where Robert De Niro, who is beginning to get a little unhinged, he, um, becoming obsessed with a political worker, he's standing in a mirror and he says over and over again, you talking to me? You talking to me? And so Matthew here looks over at Christ as if to gesture and to say, are you talking to me? And clearly Christ is. Now let's think about this painting from another point of view. Because when and where is this work? Because this is not the kind of thing that Matthew or his friends would have worn during the time zero in the Holy Land. That what Caravaggio has done is magically transported St. Matthew from far away all the way to an Italian tavern. And look, I mean, the people here are wearing swords. I mean, which wasn't altogether that uncommon. Caravaggio thought himself quite a swordsman. He actually was. He killed somebody once over um, a tennis match. That's true. And got into a fine fight once over a bowl of broccoli. Also true. Um, but here we have this man with a sword. The clothing that they're wear wearing is remarkably anachronistic, which means it doesn't make sense in regards to timeline. But that's okay. What Caravaggio was interested in doing was using art as a way of making religion contemporary for people. He drew from life. Like he drew people and the people he used as models were often not the well-to-do or the elite. I mean, there's a famous story and I'll show you the work in a second that the model for uh, one of Caravaggio's paintings for Mary was a local prostitute. 
And this made people really angry. How can you paint the mother of God from a prostitute? And Caravaggio always said, let's not forget that St. Peter was an illiterate fisherman, right? They weren't saints before they became saints. Um, and so, so there is this sense of realism for Caravaggio's time frame. Now, when I teach this class at Louisiana Tech, I often have many art makers in them. And it's usually sophomores in that class. And they usually, by the time they've hit the, the ripe old age of 19, believe that art history is not important, that all they need is their own artistic genius. And then I give them the hand of Christ. And I ask them, hey, look at that hand of Christ. And I want you to think about it. And I want you to think about where you've seen that hand of Christ before. And they think... And they look and they say, hey, I've seen that hand before, Adam, God. And if I flip it around because I can look at that ding, 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 winner. What has Caravaggio done? Caravaggio has taken the hand of Christ and painted it as if it was the hand of Adam. Now, I guess there's two ways this could have happened. One, in the art world, we call that a happy accident. Whoops-a-daisy, had no idea what I was doing, but man, that worked out perfect. But I suggest to you something else happened. This wasn't an accident, that Adam is our first man, and Christ is the second Adam, our second beginning. And in order to reinforce visually that theological idea, he has created this mimicking hand of Christ based on Adam. Did people get this connection? Of course they did. Of course they did. This painting was accessible to people and to walk from Santa Luigi to Francesi to the Vatican Museum, or how about just this, to the space near the Vatican, you can do that walk if motivated in 15 minutes. 15 minutes, no problem. So the question is, do you think Caravaggio saw this painting? Well, yeah, of course he did. A lot of things we've talked about in this class. And I say, does this mean that Bob saw this earlier work by, by Steve? And the answer is no, it's just part of a visual reference, cultural reference that is very common. Do I think Caravaggio saw that? The answer is, I would bet my son's first, you know, my left arm on it. Of course he did. One of the cool things about this painting, at least I think it's kind of cool, is when you go visit this in person, um, and oh, I should I should bring in a picture, uh, show you another picture of this. When you look at this, when you go to the, visit this in person, there's a little box over here. This little box over there is the light box. This thing is not well lit. There's a window, you'll see a window above everything. Um, when you go see it in person, there is a lot of people in front of it, but you have to pay to light it up. People will actually like fight for the honor of putting money into the box. It's the craziest thing. Nowhere else have I seen this where people will stop you upon putting a coin into the box and they say, no, 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 no. Allow me the honor of putting um, the money in the box. And almost every time I've been there, there's usually change up there so like if like I go to put in 50 cents and somebody's already put 50 cents in, I'll put the 50 cents on top and then people will use that. It's actually really, really cool. This is those three paintings together. We have, it's called the Matthew cycle. Over here, we have the calling of St. Matthew. Over here is the inspiration of St. Matthew. Um, we've looked at these kind of Matthews before, right? Um, Matthew writing the Gospels down. Think of those eliminated manuscripts. And over here, we have the martyrdom of St. Matthew. I want to call your attention to what I think is a pretty cool thing. This is the light from the window. And this is the light that cast cascades down on this painting. And I don't mean to suggest to you that this slope of line is the same as this slope of line. But they're kind of related. 
what Caravaggio has done is painted this work so that the light in the composition, an artificial light, a created light, more or less matches the light created in the physical space in which it is. And I think that's really cool. When you go to Vatican Museum, and you should because you can see this, this, you can also see this. This is the entombment, and I think it's kind of cool. So, well, I don't think it's kind of cool. It is kind of cool. And so I want to call your attention to something I think is important, and that is eye level. Where's the eye level for the viewer in this composition? Because Caravaggio, as an art maker, is eternally aware of this. And that was my drink of coffee so that you can think things through. Think about this stone here. Are you above or below it? And the answer is neither. If you're above it, you would see the top of that stone. If you were below it, you'd see the bottom of it. Instead, all you see is this line. So this is our eye level. And what we have here is Christ being lowered into his tomb. And around it, we have Mary. We have Mary. We have Joseph of Arimathea. Um, we have um, St. John. We have all the, the, like those major figures are, are often shown at the crucifixion and at the, uh, at the deposition. So this is an entombment painting. It is the putting of the body of Christ into the tomb. And how do they have this hung in the Vatican Museum? Forgive this picture. And I'm usually much more happy when I stand in front of Caravaggio paintings and seemingly I am in this one, but here you go. I mean, not that the Vatican needs help hanging paintings, but they have it hung correctly. Think about this dramatic use of light and dark, this chiaroscuro, which brightly illuminates the body of Christ and has this nighttime riveting the background, which I think is really fantastic. Now, I call your attention, my friends, to the arm of Christ. Look at that. Where have you seen that arm before? And I'm going to beat this dead horse to, until the dead, the dead horse reeks for mercy because, because it's an important idea. And that is really, really good art makers have an awareness of art history. It's just, you have to know what's been done before. Um, you have to be able to borrow, modify, adapt, and change it, of course. You have to be aware of it. Um, and I would suggest to you that, that Caravaggio knew about that arm. Or again, it could just be a happy accident. What do I know? But I'm guessing that this, in St. Peter's, is the kind of thing he, that he would have been aware of, certainly would have been aware of. And so these are the kind of paintings that we see in Italy. Let's shift gears a little bit and talk about something that's going on in Spain, because Spain is similar to Italy in some ways in that they are Catholic, very Catholic, ooh, we Catholic, but they also have something else that Italy does not have, and that is a constitutional monarch monarchy with a king, with princes and princesses, and then a gazillion barons and viscounts and dukes and all that other nonsense that aristocracies and monarchies have. And so what I'm showing you here is a large sale painting, sort of a group portrait of by Diego Velasquez called Las Meninas. And if you have to, if you, if you want to know the English translation, it's usually called the Maids of Honor. And so it's a large painting. It's in the, um, oh gosh, is it in the, it's in the Prado in, in Spain. And it's just, just fantastic. And so let's talk about what it is we see, because that's a really important place for us to start. To begin with, we can think about the foreground. The center of the composition is this young lady here. She's the princess and she's being waited on by this person there and this person there. These are her maidens, right? Um, if you're a, a Spanish princess, you're not expected to do anything by yourself, right? Like, 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 uh, was it or this weekend? My three-year-old, um, uh, he put on his day clothes all by himself. Like, like he went to his bedroom, came out and he was dressed. He's like, I did it all by myself. I'm like, good job, Hambone. That's his nickname, Hambone. 
Hambone gets dressed all by himself. If you are the Spanish princess, you don't do that. And so these people are assisting her in her getting, getting ready for the day routine in the background here. And I'll show you some details. We have a nun and a parish priest. Over here, we have a little a girl who's going to be missing a foot in a second because that dog is going to eat it. And right here, we have a court dwarf. And you might be wondering, why is there a dwarf? And there's actually a really important and, and, and logical reason why there's a dwarf, at least logical as it exists in the middle 17th century. In order to understand this, I ask you to recall back um, the, 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 third, the second and third centuries, and into the fourth century for that matter, of, of the Roman Empire when we had the soldier emperors, right? So after Marcus Aurelius, and we have Commodus who becomes um, emperor, then we have a new emperor pretty much every 18 months because people get sick of Commodus. A strong general gains the support of the army. He goes and kills the emperor. He's emperor until a new general does the exact same thing to him. Um, as a result, if you are a king, there are some people who you can't trust and some people who you can trust, right? You figure everybody wants to be king, so that makes you suspicious. But a person who you can trust without any doubt is a dwarf, because a dwarf could never have um, the idea of ever becoming king himself or herself. And so all throughout Europe, we begin to see dwarves occupy very interesting positions of power throughout the courts of Europe. And, and I'm really behind the curve in all of this. But earlier this week, my wife and I just finished season six of Game of Thrones, um, and and there is a character in that in that in that show played by Peter Dinklage, a remarkably talented actor who plays uh, Tyrion Lan Lannister. And he, if you don't know Peter Dinklage, he he is he's a dwarf, um, and he be, and he's he's part of a royal family. I grant you. But he becomes the uh, a, a trusted advisor um, to oh what's her name Khaleesi whatever her name is like uh, like she's got like a thousand names but the mother of dragons lady and and one of the reasons why this can be true one is he's really smart he's politically astute and all of that but but because he clearly is not part of this group of people he can never aspire to be their ruler. And so one of the things we see in, um, in, in Europe are court dwarves becoming very popular people, very important people. And then sometimes they actually serve as a kind of jester, right? So, and this is a different kind of thing. Um, but if you've ever read um, Hamlet in the beginning of, must be the beginning of Act 5 or maybe the beginning or the end of Act 4 when Hamlet returns from his exile and he sees a, he's in a, in a graveyard and he sees um, Ophelia being being buried. He sees a skull and he says he says to his friend Horatio, alas, I, you know, and I don't I, I don't have the ability to quote Shakespeare, but uh, Yorick, a man uh, I knew him well a thousand times. I rode upon his back, a man of infinite jest, all of that stuff. Well, Yorick was the court jester, and, it, and, and Shakespeare makes suggestions that he was a dwarf. And so we see portraits of them by Velazquez in Spain. Um, they're not people to be ridiculed. They are people who are powerful, important, and respected. I mean, Sebastian de Mora, for example, will punch you in the face. This guy is not messing around. And so, so this is all really important stuff. We actually know who this gentleman was. It was Francisco Lexicano. In the background here, we have an open door which places this man somewhat in silhouette. In the back here, we have what looks to be a portrait. Maybe it's a mirror. I'll give you an option in a second. And here on the left-hand side of the composition, we have a portrait, a self-portrait of the art maker himself. He is standing before an enormous stretched canvas. If you've ever wondered what a, a canvas looks like, a canvas is essentially really thick cotton, like w densely woven cotton that is stretched over a wooden frame until it's taut. And so here you can see the stretcher, the wooden frame, the support here, 
and a large scale easel. And Velasquez is shown with a palette here and a paintbrush here. And again, look at those hands. I mean, like they're so quickly painted. Look at this, like this like dash of color here on the sleeves. So there's something interesting happening here. This was painted in 1656. And Diego Velasquez is a commoner. He's not from noble, no, a noble line. He's a common everyday person. Those are the people who generally aspired to be painters. And he um, is shown with a black doublet with a red cross in it. Now, certainly by 1656, Diego Velasquez had become the official court painter decades ago, and that employment no doubt made him a wealthy man. But being rich doesn't make you noble. And during Velasquez's lifetime, what he really wanted to be was become a member of the Order of Santiago. Again, Santiago is the name, is the, the Spanish version of James. And the Order of Santiago de Compostela was a social group made primarily of noblemen. Velasquez really wanted to be a part of this club. And so he petitioned, was denied, petitioned, and denied. And it wasn't until, I think, 1660 that he was accepted into this order. I mean, they kind of, like, gerrymandered the rules for him to say, oh, right, your great-great-grandfather on your mother's side, twice removed from your brother's cousin's nephew, was of noble stock. And so, as a result... He was elected to this order, and as a result of that, four years after he completed the painting, he came back in and painted this red cross, the sign of the order, on his doublet. You know, as, a, as the holder of a PhD from the University of Maryland, I have a really, really fancy bright red gown, and my bright red gown is nicely augmented by a super fancy pillow top hat, and I wear this hat twice a, day, twice a year. Once at commencement, once at graduation. I guess actually I, wear, I go to four graduations a year now. So I wear it all the time. One of, it would, this would be like me having this hat painted on my head in the years prior to me having earned my degree. So this was something Velasquez was exceedingly proud. Let me call your attention to this on the back wall. I think there are a couple of suggestions as to what this could be. It's suggested, and I think this works out well, that this is a painted portrait hanging on the wall. It looks like what you would expect a double portrait of the king and queen would look like. And if you don't believe it looks like the king, let me show you the king. There he is. Velasquez paints him a lot. There's 1624, 1628. 1634, 1652. I mean, this is our good boy, King Philip. King Philip is part of the Habsburg dynasty. The Habsburgs are a German family. A long time ago, when talking about Egyptian art, I talked about the intermingling of the of the the um, of the monarchies in Europe, and the Habsburgs are a great example of that. The Habsburgs um, are German by by lineage but Spanish and Netherlandish in, in, their, um, in, their, um, uh, in their countries. So Sp Spain at this point has a colony in the Netherlands. We'll talk about that in a little while. So this very likely is a, is, a, uh, is a portrait of Philip and his wife. It could also serve as a mirror. And that is Philip and his wife are standing in this physical space, we can't see them because the space ends here. But if we imagine the meta space, the space outside of this painting, they're where we are, right? Sort of like the Arno Fini portrait. Remember the Arno Fini portrait way back in the day, so long ago that you've forgotten, but because I'm a gamer, I'll find it for you and show it to you. In the Arno Fini portrait, Jan van Eyck shows us both the two people we see. Giovanni and Giovanna, the alien and his wife, but also two people we know are in the room, but we can't see. They're in our space where we are. And when we talked about this, I suggested to you that what this means is that they are a stand-in for us. We are them. And this means that we are the king. 
we are the queen. They're standing together as if they're posing. And what's happening? Velasquez is painting them himself. Like this is the canvas. This is painted in a very specific part of the Royal Palace. And it was a room that existed with these paintings that actually existed. So art historians, because we're go-getters, they have gone around and looked at all of these objects to, to, uh, to think about them individually. So, so this is an interesting composition for a couple of cool reasons. One, it suggests the ways in which the, the, um, the monarchy is the important patron in the arts, but also suggests that Diego Velasquez is sort of like an extended member of this family, right? He's not just a hired servant. He's like Uncle Diego. He's been accepted as certainly not a member of the family, but a trusted person of the court. There are religious paintings that exist all throughout Spain, but Spain has something that Italy does not have. And that something comes back to art all the time. And that is portraits of the royalty, both as it pertains to the king and queen and princes and princesses, but also the vast net of aristocracy that Spain certainly has. Okay, this has been an early artifact for the Baroque time. Our next artifact, what we'll do is we'll look at Italian architecture and Italian sculpture. And for the next artifact, what we'll do is we'll look at the art that was made in the northern part of Europe, both in, a, in Catholic places like Flanders, but also in uh, Protestant places like Holland.